Today we're going to be creating an NFT collection from start to finish, looking at the artwork generation, the contract, as well as a minting dApp. It's going to be the ultimate guide of creating an updated NFT collection V2 because I've made this before, but this video is quite different. Hey, how's it going guys? My name is Daniel, aka Hashlips, and in today's video, like I said, we're going to be looking at how to create an NFT collection from start to finish. It's very important to know that we're going to be using a low gas contract for this. It's going to be super efficient and we're going to be starting off with the artwork creation. This video is coming out right before our master classes, which are going to be live the 8th to the 10th of March. And that's next week, or maybe it's in a few days, depending on when this video comes out. But go and participate. All you need is a sketchy AF book club NFT, and you can get them off OpenSea. I'll leave a link right below. And then you can participate live with me asking questions. But that being said, I want to create this video so that we're going to create everything we will be doing in the masterclass, but with the added benefit of um, in the masterclass doing stuff a bit different. This will show you everything that's involved in creating an NFT collection so that you as an artist, a developer, or anyone really interested in NFTs gets the chance to have your own collection. Let's jump right in and see how we can start off creating the artworks. We are starting off with the artworks. Now, generative NFT collections usually consist of a bunch of different attributes in single files bundled up together to create new types of artworks. What do I mean by attributes? Well, on Photoshop over here on my layer section, you can see I've got different color backgrounds. Simultaneously, I've got background props, such as these aliens, then a light, as well as uh, a none attribute, which is empty. Then we get to the fur, and the fur is basically the base of our character. We get a skin, so as I add the skin, you can see it all starts building up. You have to think about this process beforehand before you start building out your collection. Separate your layers into the different elements that can change, for instance the mouth, the eyes, and so on. The program that we're going to use are going to use these different layers and then generate new images for us. So step number one would be to create all of your different attributes, such as a few different variants of backgrounds, then a few different variants of whatever attributes you want to place on. Think of the layer order, making sure that you arrange them properly. It doesn't help that you have some kind of background attribute such as this, light and then put the fur below it. I mean it looks quite cool but if this is not the desired effect this won't work. The same can be said for the skin. If we place that below the uh, fur as well you simply won't see it. So keep the order in mind it's not so much important in Photoshop or the image manipulation tool but when we get to the program this is very crucial. Design everything and we should end up with something looking like this. How cool is that? Now the program will be able to generate thousands of these images along with metadata. If you don't understand the concept of metadata, don't be scared. Basically it's extra information about the image. It shows things like the description, the name, and where that image is located on a different server. This is pretty cool and the program will generate something like this for each image automatically. So it's not something you need to worry about. Just know that this is going to be generated with our NFT collection. It is crucial extra information for marketplaces to make use of. Marketplaces can read the extra data on our image and display things like the properties as well as the name that this image has. This is very cool and it usually comes in the form of JSON. Now let's jump back into the creation of the art. Jumping back to the artworks, I'm ready to export everything. I've selected all the layers and made the ones visible that I'm going to export one by one. Now here's a neat trick. You can go to File, then go to Export on Photoshop and select Layers to Files. Once you've done this, select a location. I'm going to save it on my desktop 
under a new folder called raw. In here, gonna click on open, no prefix for the name and very crucial, you need to keep the, uh, the layers not trimmed. So make sure trim layers is deselected. We need these uh, cubistic kind of images to be the exact same size. Even if the eyes look small, it is crucial because these layers will just simply overlap in the program. Click on run and have Photoshop export each layer individually. Here is my raw folder now and inside I can see all the attributes that we have. This is pretty cool. So now everything is in one folder. It is my job to go and organize these into the respective folders that they fall into. So let's go and organize. After going through the files one by one, I came up with this structure. I made a folder called master class and in there have another folder called layers, all lowercase. Then inside layers, I can open it up. We've got the background, background props, eyes, fur, mouth and skin. So I took the images and placed them all in the respective folders. All the background props, all the eyes and all of the furs in a folder of their own. So at this point, you should have something looking like this with all the respective items in their respective folder. These are going to be our traits. The namings are very important and will show up in the metadata. So keep in mind that for the background, this will be the title and then whatever background was selected, this will be the traits title. So keep them like that. Now it's time for us to go ahead and install our program that we are going to use and generate our images. We are going to need a few prerequisites and one of them is an IDE. So I prefer this code editor, Visual Studio Code, and go ahead to this link up here to download it for your operating system. After that, make sure that you have Node.js installed on your operating system too. You can go to this link up here, but I found that works best is not the latest version. Go ahead and go down to previous releases. Once you are here, you can see all the Node versions. Because of the Canvas API, what I've realized is that a previous version and the specific version is Node 14.18.2 works the best. So go to Downloads and then go and download it here for your operating system and for the right architecture. Now it's time to get down to business and download the Hashlips Art Engine. You can go to github.com forward slash Hashlips and search for this repo. I'm going to click on it and you can also go directly to this URL over there. But then important is keep your eye on the release. I'm going to focus on downloading the release version 1.1.2. I'm going to click on releases over here. And then once I get to this page, I can simply click and download the zip source code. Unzip this and place it inside of the folder that we just created. We are now back at the masterclass folder and then here is our zip. I'm going to double click on this to unzip it and then I can remove the zip file. This is the art engine and you don't have to worry about all the things happening inside here. We're going to open this folder not here but instead we're going to use Visual Studio Code. Once you've opened the IDE Visual Studio Code, you can either click on open over there or go file open. I'm going to click on open, then go to the folder, master class, select Hashlips Art Engine, and then open. It should look like this, and you should have all the folders and files of the art engine on the left hand side. This means that you are now in the root directory, and we need to be in the root in order to run the program's executable scripts. The first thing we need to do is test that we have done everything correctly up until this point. So go to the top tabs where it says terminal, click terminal and new terminal. This will bring up the terminal screen like this. And now we're going to validate if we have node installed correctly. So in the terminal, run the command node space dash V. When you click on enter, it should tell you the version of node that you have installed. 
at this point, if you do not see the node version 14.18.2, you have done something wrong, so please go and install Node.js again. If you are a more experienced developer, you can go ahead and play around with different node versions. But make sure that you see this version. The next thing is to install the dependencies and we can run the command npm install and then hit enter. This will install the canvas dependencies that we'll need to generate the artworks. Give it some time to do its thing and then once it's done we can start generating artworks. It looks like our dependencies have installed. You should see a screen like this, depending on your node version it might look different but if something completely went wrong, we will find out in the next step. So after this, you're going to run this. npm run generate and hit enter. If you see this where it says node index.js and it created five NFTs or the images and metadata, then it means it worked, the program is ready and we can start generating your artworks. You will also see a new build folder up here on the left hand corner. In here are the actual images that just got generated from the base project, as well as a JSON folder with the respective JSON uh, metadata in it. So I'm just going to collapse the build folder. But if this didn't work for you and you got an error over here, usually if you are using a Mac with an M1 chip running the ARM architecture, this could create a problem. There have been many who struggled with this and coincidentally I am running an M1 chip but I got it to work and there is a workaround. It is just very extensive and I will make an updated video on how you can get this to run on the M1. If you want to try it yourself, you can go to this article which is an issue that was raised and here a community member actually brought out a solution which you can try. I'm not going to discuss it here, but still don't get discouraged if you are using a Mac with an M1. Try it first out and see if it works for you, but I can say to make it work, you need to run Rosetta in your terminal and just make sure that you're running on a lower node version, like explained in that article. The reason why I don't want you to be discouraged is because after this whole process, I'm going to show the Mac users or anyone else who just wants to use and generate images from Photoshop directly a different way that you can do that too and that definitely works for everyone. If you are not using a M1 chip on a Mac and you got an error at this point, please just follow the previous steps and you should be good. Let's carry on and now import the rest of our folders so that we can generate the new artworks. If you're really stuck at this point and you don't know what to do, go to the hashtips.online website and join the Discord. You can click there and join the Discord. There's over 21,000 members and I'm sure everyone in there has experienced what you have and can help you out. People have been known to come up with nice solutions over there and I urge you to join the Discord channel anyway and become a part of the Hashtips family. We always learn and innovate and it will be exciting to have you there as well. Let's now look at the program briefly. The only folders that you need to worry about are the layers folder as well as the source. In the source file, the SRC, you can open it up and it has a config.js file. This is the configuration, the brain that you kind of go and manipulate kind of to generate your collections. We can choose between Solana and Ethereum or Polygon metadata. I will get to this in a second. The other folder, like I mentioned, are the layers. Coincidentally, we already have this layers folder that we've set up in the beginning of this video. I want you to pay attention to this config.js file, the one that we've just opened. If you scroll down, you see a section where there's layers configuration. These layer configurations tie directly with exactly the same spelling I have to add in the layers folder over here. We've got a background, an eyeball, and so on. We're going to replace the folder structure over here, as well as the entire layer folder. So let's go ahead and do that change. You can make this change in Visual Studio Code, or I'm going to do it in the folder structure over here. 
If we open the art engine, we can see there's the layers folder. I'm going to close this and then drag my layers in there, replacing all the contents inside of the Hashtabs art engine. If I now go back to Visual Studio Code, we should see our new layers over there. Remember the eyes, the fur, the mouth and the skin? Well, here they are. Now it's up to me to go ahead and create the respective folders over here as well. I can remove these and just start off by the background. This is already there for us, but this is a lowercase background and it has to be the exact same spelling. The next attribute is I'm going to copy and paste it in there, keeping the commas at the end and now just adding the second one. In this case, the order is very important. So first it needs to be the background, then the prop, then next should be the fur. So I'm going to copy this, paste it over there and then replace it with the fur. Currently we've got the background, background prop and fur popping up. We technically now need the skin to come in. So let's go and add the skin. And then next we will need the uh, eyes. So the eyes and lastly the mouth. Once you save this, I press command S, but you can also say file save. We can go down to the bottom over here and then simply run the command again. In the terminal, you do not need to reinstall node. You can only run npm run generate. So you can either run it like this, click, and then it should start generating our new collection. Or in a terminal, you can always click on the up arrow and it will run the previous command or place the previous command in there that you've run. So we can just press up and then enter again. You can see that we are generating five NFTs and that's because the grow edition size is set to five. I'm going to create a collection of 20. So I'm going to change the growth edition size to 20. Save the file and in the terminal, I'm going to press up arrow or type that in and then press enter. Now it's going to generate 20 uh, NFTs basically. It's not NFTs yet, it's just images with metadata, but you get what I'm saying. In the builds folder over here at the top, we can now open the images and there are our brand new generated images. How beautiful. You will notice that in the JSON file, if we click on JSON 1 and image 1, you will see that the attributes follow along. So what I mean by that is if we click on the metadata JSON for image 1, you can see that we've got a teal background, a backlight, the fur, artist canvas, and diamond skin. And indeed, this is a teal background with the light and a diamond skin. This reflects what the image holds. And like I said, the uh, OpenSea or marketplaces for that matter will be able to read this. There's a few attributes that I would like to change, like the name of my collection, as well as the description. We can go back to the uh, config.js file over there. And here at the top, it says your collection. So I'm going to change this to the maybe cool ape. And then obviously you can change uh, this too. So I'm just going to say this too. I don't know. Um, perfect. So we're going to change cool ape and this too. And I'm going to save it and run. So up arrow on the terminal. Make sure I've saved the config.js file. Click enter. And now we can see it being generated. If we click on a JSON file, we can see we have a new name as well as a new description. Currently, we are generating NFTs and that's pretty cool. Uh, we get the images and the metadata, but what if I want to make certain attributes more rare? For instance, what if I feel like this ultimate script background should be the rarest of the three backgrounds? This is where rarity traits come in and it's basically just a weight. How weights work is at the end of your file's name, for instance, this teal background, we're going to add a weight. Keep in mind, by default, the weight is always one. So if you start adding weights, you need to start adding them to this folder. And weights are associated per folder basis, so each folder has their own weight group. 
So let's say we want to make the ultimate script the most rare. We are going to give this a weight maybe of hashtag 2. Then the rest for the teal background, I'm going to add a hashtag maybe 20. And for the yellow, um, the sunny yellow, that's maybe the most common. So I'm going to add hashtag uh, 100. I'm going to click and uh, we don't have to save. But what I'm going to do is just go and regenerate the collection. Now, if this is correct, the build folder should have a lot of yellow backgrounds and only sometimes a bit of teal. And then on a very rare occasion, and I'm not even sure if this is going to show up in this small collection, we'll have a ultimate script. Oh, and there it is. <laughs> what a perfect example. So only once out of the 20, the script showed up. The teal background showed up a bit more, but the yellow is overpowering. And that is how the rarity weights work. You can set these, uh, like I said, on each of these folders if you like to. Keep in mind the base uh, rarity trait or the rarity weight is 1. So there we have it. Our collection is now generated. The only thing left to do is basically to upload this now to IPFS, a decentralized storage network. I'm going to show you how to do that. Keeping in mind, I did mention that I'm going to show you how to do this exact same generation process, but I'll do that after IPFS because that process has its own IPFS way as well. We are not completely done in the sense that the JSON files, if you look at the image over here, it says IPFS and then new URI to replace. We need to replace this, but in order to get this URI or the CID as it's known, is we first need to upload the image set. So I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and do that. And then once we've done this, we need to run a simple command. Once we've done that, our collection should be on IPFS. And then we can get to the contract part. Before we continue, I would like to mention that this is just the tip of the iceberg of generating artworks with the Hashups Art Engine. There's a lot more that you can do, generating different types of metadata, doing configurations, mixing up configurations, uh, generating GIFs, text, and even pixelating artworks, just to name a few. This is a growing product and we are in the process of redeveloping it. But for now, just know that my YouTube channel is filled with examples, tips and tricks where you can learn more on the different nuances that you can try with this art engine. For now, I'm focused on showing you the process of what you're going to go through when you are generating your collection. So now that we have our image set with the JSON, we are technically ready to rock and to go. And our next step is IPFS. If you really want to know how to do different generative things and it's not explained in my videos, join the masterclass next week. I will be happy to show you and answer all those questions. Then let's get to IPFS. As you can see, I've already downloaded the uh, simple application that they provide. IPFS is a decentralized network of storage. You can store stuff in a decentralized fashion, unlike centralized services. So we're going to click on install over there and click on IPFS desktop. We're simply going to use the desktop application to upload our content because we can upload bigger files and more files at once. And then we're going to use Pinata, which is another service I will show you. But our first step is to download this. I'm going to click and download this for Mac OS. So going down, this is the release page. And if I click there, if you scroll down a bit more, here you can see the different architecture downloads. I just downloaded the DMG and I'm going to go ahead and install this right now. While we wait for the IPFS application to install, go ahead and go to pinata.cloud and sign up for a free subscription. They also have payable plans, but this is only if you upload larger amounts of data. Pinata is a pinning service, which means that you don't need to run a decentralized uh, node to store your data. I am simply using the IPFS desktop application node for a temporary use so that I can upload larger and more files at once. Once you've signed up, you can get to the dashboard like this. And like I've mentioned, you can do everything we're about to do straight from the browser by clicking on upload and uploading the folder. 
but we are instead going to upload a CID directly. A CID is an identity of the data and where it lives. And the reason for that is so that you can in the future upload more files at once. So I'll rather show you the correct way of doing it or how I am doing it at least. Just by the way, you can see that I've got data already stored on my service. Now each data set comes with a CID and this will change if the underlying data changes. So the CID never changes unless the data changes. So these CIDs are quite important and I'll get to them in just a second. But for now understand that this is like an ID to where that uh, piece of data lives and what it's constructed of. When you open IPFS, it's going to look like this after the installation. So now go ahead and go to the files tab and in here we're going to import the images folder. It's important that we only import the images folder at this point. So go ahead and click on import, select a folder and then search for that folder that we've just created. So inside the art engine, in the build folder, here are the images. So go ahead and click on upload. The reason why we only would like the images to be here is so that we can actually use the CID and pin it or basically just point it to the JSON files. I'll show you now what I mean. Technically behind the scenes what's happening is we are busy hosting the data live on IPFS but we are also hosting other people's uh, files and it's running through this program. As you can see on the status, we've got incoming and outgoing traffic. So uh, that's the reason why I use uh, Pinata so that I don't have to constantly keep this up and running, you know, at least for the time period before it gets replicated. Before we pin it to Pinata, what we need to make sure is click on these three dots and make sure that if we click on inspect, that the amount of links is the correct size of your NFT collection. So we've got 20 images and I can see indeed we've got 20 links and it's linked up uh, all fine. Now I can go back to the files, go to the three dots, click on copy CID and head to Pinata. Over here, like I said, we can actually upload the folder if it's a small collection directly or we can now import it through a CID itself. So to import the CID from the IPFS application, we can click on CID and then paste it over there, the one that we've just copied. Then give it a name, I'm gonna call it uh, Cool Apes, like that. Maybe Cool Apes AA because I just uh, created a similar thing. Remember to call it maybe something that it is. So I'm gonna call these the um, images and then say search and pin. Once I've done this, I can now go and refresh the page and we should see it's being queued. Now the queued should update and here we go. It is pre-checking the images, there we go, and it's now starting to upload. And that's how easy it is. Once this is done, it should say searching and uh, retrieving, and then once it's done with its process, we should see a link uh, here at the very top. The other way of doing this exact same thing is by clicking on upload, folder, select folder, and you can now go and select it uh, how we did with the other one as well. Images and upload. I'm gonna say yes, and this might seem like an easier process, and yes, it does work uh, fine for smaller collections. So I can show you this. Maybe I'll call this the very cool uh, apes and images and then say upload. This will do the exact same process that we do throughout the IPFS, but just keep in mind, this will work because it's a very small collection. Bigger collections tend to fail because there's a lot of images. So now it says it's successful and you can see the very cool apes images are already here. If we refresh and see how long our uh, pinning is taking, it's taking quite longer because it needs to search for it. But it's done over there and the reason why it is um, not showing up is because it recognizes that it's the exact same data. 
so it won't replicate you know the same data in here so that's why i'll upload on the folder you know won the race basically but you can decide which way you want to do either wait for the pinning to happen if you have many files or upload them directly the end goal is just to get the images over here with a CID of itself. So like I mentioned before, the CID is the DNA, the kind of ID of that data, and we can find it with this ID. So if we go and we click on this eye icon, this we can open a page like this, and you can see it's using a gateway. By the way, you can find this particular piece of data through any gateway. It doesn't have to be through Pinata now because it's being pinned. However, it's pointing to this folder over here. So if I just refresh and try and retrieve the data, I might not get to the main folder now, but if I type in forward slash here at the end and I click, let's say 2.png, we should be able to pull in the number two uh, image that we've created or the number two image of our collection. And there it is. We can simultaneously do this for each one of our images. So this will be the, uh, how can I say, the location of where our image lives on the decentralized storage. And this is everything from here up until this point. Everything behind here is simply a gateway and can change, but will retrieve the exact same data. I hope that makes sense. Well, the next thing we need to do is actually copy the CID and replace it inside of our metadata. So let's go to Pinata. Let's make sure we copy the correct CID. Once we've done that, let's go back to our program. The goal now is to go ahead to change this JSON metadata that's being generated. We don't want to, at this point, create a new collection because we already have the data uploaded. We simply want to replace this IPFS, this part over there. And how can we do that? Well, if we go to the uh, config.js file, you can see there's the base URI. We need to replace this part over here with our CID. It still needs to have the IPFS and look exactly like this, apart from this should be your images CID. Once you have done this, save the file and down in the terminal, run the following command. The command I would like to run is npm run and then update underscore info. When I do that and click enter, you will see that it updated the description as well as the name and this IPFS link. This didn't regenerate the collection, but simply updated the JSON files to point to this. Because remember, marketplaces are going to read this metadata file and then look for the images in an IPFS link like so. Thus, uncovering and discovering your image. So each one of these files have been updated to have the correct CID. At this point, now we can go ahead and upload our metadata to IPFS. In the JSON file of your collection, basically there's this underscore metadata.json file. Go and delete this file because we don't need this. Basically that file consists of all the metadata and it's not necessary and might break things if we do some uh, executions on it with the DAP. So just delete that and then let's go ahead and see how we can upload this. So the two ways, like I've showed you before, is you can use the IPFS desktop application, upload it here first if there's a lot of files, and then link it with a CID to Pinata. Or what I'm going to do is simply upload it directly, seeing that this file is not really that big. I'm going to go and search for it. So hashlips art engine, and there's the JSON folder. Click on upload, say yes, and let's give it a name. I tend to use a convention of calling it the same name. So very cool apes, and then underscore uh, meta data, like so. Now that we have this, I'm going to say upload, wait a bit, and then we should have our content on the decentralized network. This is very exciting. And there we go. We have our metadata and our images. You can see that the metadata also has its own CID.
This is important because this is the CID we will put into the contract when we deploy it. So just so you fully understand what will happen in the back. Our images are now living on IPFS and we have all of the metadata. The metadata simply is there to provide extra information about the images and as well as a location to where they live. That's why this was a two-step process. If we go ahead and view the metadata right now, this will load up the link and then we will get to go to any one of our images metadata. Let's give this a second to load up. And there we go. It's pointing to it here and you can see the whole folder. Essentially, the contract will take in this folder and display and give us something back. For instance, it might search for the fifth NFT metadata. So it will return to us um, number five and then dot JSON. I'm going to go ahead and uh, just click on this to show you the metadata. This is now the JSON file. So this is what the marketplaces query from the contract. They get back this and then they can display how they need to on the screen that NFT. It can display the name, the description, where the image is living. And um, you notice that there's no gateway in front of this. This is usually done so that marketplaces can put their own gateway. For instance, you can see here we're using um, the gateway of, of uh, Pinata. But if I had to copy everything from here to there, and let's use IPFS directly. So what we can do is just go to ipfs.io forward slash ipfs and replace this. We should see that we get the exact same cool ape number five. So here you can see it works with two different gateways. And that is basically because IPFS doesn't live on the gateway. The gateway is just there to um, basically serve the data. And uh, this is kind of it. Now, if you want to see the image, we can just copy everything from here to there. And let's go and replace this at the top and click on enter. And there's the image. And that is why you will need to have metadata and images separately because one needs to point to the images and one is the metadata, the extra data of your NFT. This is fantastic. It means that you are now complete with your very first step. There are three main steps and it's the art generation with IPFS, creating the contract, deploying it with the DAP and then doing the Discord and so on. But your very first step is complete and at this point we are ready for the contract deployment on the blockchain. But I do want to show the alternative way of also getting to this point from a Photoshop script kind of view. If you were struggling with the Hashtips Art engine and you didn't really understand how to uh, get it to work, then you can just watch this next section where I quickly explain how you can generate the images using Photoshop directly and doing this uh, metadata upload and how you can swap the metadata out as well. And uh, if you got successfully to this point and you don't want to watch that section, that's perfectly fine. Just skip ahead. Uh, till we get to the start of the deployment of the contract. Now I'm going to quickly show you another way of generating the artworks and the metadata right through Photoshop. So go ahead and go to this URL here at the top. Make sure you get to this repo and as always download the release that I show in the video, version 1.0.1. .1. It is a simple script so once you get here just simply click on the source code zip file. Once you have now downloaded the folder and unzipped it, here it is. Open it up and save the Photoshop file, and this is very crucial, inside of this folder in order to do it the Photoshop route. So let's go ahead and open Photoshop, click on file, save as, save to this computer. Then in the desktop, I have this new folder that I've downloaded. Here you can see and click on save. Okay, and now if we open it up, you can see there's my test.psd. And we have got a generate.js and an update metadata file. I'll show you how to use these in just a second. The next step is to actually organize these layers into groups. In order to group layers, it's fairly straightforward. 
I have already grouped the background, the background props, fur and the skin. For these eye sets I can just select them, right click and then say group from layers. Now I can just say these will be the eyes. The same thing I can do for the mouth, select it all, group from layers and call it the mouth group. This is how your Photoshop file should look like in order to use the script. Everything needs to be in a group, otherwise this will not work. You can just place it in the correct order, for instance the background first, the background props, fur, skin, eyes and mouth. You don't need to unselect or deselect anything making it visible and invisible. The program will take care of that automatically. The next steps are very easy. Simply go to File, go down to where it says Script and click on Browse. You get to search for the script now so go to Desktop or wherever you've saved this folder and here it is. There's our test.psd, the actual PSD file that we have open. I want you to select the generate.js script and if you cannot find it just make sure that you can search for .js files. Click on open and the script will start to run. Here it will ask you some questions if you want to continue. Yes we do want to. How many do you want to create? And here I will enter 20, click on OK. What is the collection's name? In this case I'm going to call this the PS uh, Cool Apes. OK, and then the description. OK, so blah, <laughs> blah, blah. Perfect. Now it's going to generate 20 images and let's click on OK. This process might take a while, so just leave your computer depending on how many files you're generating. You should technically be seeing them generating um, in real time. So if we go there, you should see them being populating. And there we go, but just leave it to run until it's complete. And just like that, the collection is now complete. We also have a build folder with all the images in it, as well as the respective metadata. What we can do now is we need to upload it to IPFS, and then remember, we need to update the metadata to fit. How we do it this time is a bit different. So we can go back to the browser, Click on Upload Folder, and in this case, we need to go and find that images file. Click on Upload. This time, I'm going to call it DPS, Very Cool Apes Images. Upload that, and then let's just wait for the CID to be generated so that we can replace it in Photoshop. There we have our PS Very Cool Apes, much like before. The images are now uploaded. Time for doing our second step. Copy the CID of these new images. Let's go ahead and go to Photoshop. Click on File, Script, and this time when you browse for a script, select the update underscore metadata.js file. Click on Open. It's going to tell us that we're about to update the metadata, which is fine, and it needs a prefix. So the prefix in this case will be IPFS colon forward slash forward slash and then we're going to say this is the prefix with um, the CID and a forward slash. That is very important. So it is IPFS colon forward slash forward slash the CID and a trailing forward slash. Click on OK. Then the suffix, which would be dot PNG. Click OK. And it's complete. So now that that's complete, we can go back to Pinata, Upload, Folder, select the folder, go back to the desktop, Build, Metadata, Upload. Click on OK, and again, PS, very cool, Apes, and this will be the Metadata. So now we are uploading the metadata and how quick and easy was the Photoshop way? That is pretty cool and now soon we'll have our images as well as our metadata. Always test that your JSON file points to the right image set. So 
here we can click on the metadata for the PS version now and then wait for it to load. It is always important to test the metadata to see if it points to the correct image set. So click on this little eye icon and then we're going to go ahead and maybe select 2.json. Hit enter and let's see the metadata coming back. It says there have been too many requests, so we most likely want to use a different IPFS provider. So let me try IPFS.io and uh, there we go. So trying a different gateway just shows you sometimes works a bit better and it works pretty well. We can try another one, so maybe 7.json, perfect, and everything changes. I can go ahead now and copy this image and let's replace it just to see if we can actually find that image. And there we have it. Beautiful. That is the Photoshop way. Obviously it has its drawbacks. It's not as uh, kind of fleshed out as the Hashtips Art Engine with all its features. But if you need a basic generation with quick metadata, this can be done too. Before we forget, we actually need also a hidden image as well as a hidden metadata item. Why is this? Well, you often see collections having a pre-reveal image, meaning that we don't want to show this data to the world. Let's go ahead and create the image as well as the metadata item. To create that data set for the hidden, I would say, data, is I create a folder. It can be called anything. I called mine hidden. Inside, we've got two subsequent folders, hidden uh, image and hidden underscore metadata. In the hidden image uh, folder, we've got one image called hidden. Then this is how it looks. It's a big question mark. It can be a .png or JPEG, whatever you prefer. We also have another folder, like I said, the metadata part, where this is also called hidden.json. Now, if I open this, you can see that the JSON is very small. All this is, is a name, a description, and an image location. You can see it also needs a CID, and this is going to point to the fully qualified, I would say, IPFS URL. You will see what I mean in a second. Let's first go and upload our image, and then replace the CID again for this single hidden file. Because we're only dealing with one file, I'm going to upload it directly to Pinata. So upload a new folder, go and select one, go to desktop, go to my hidden one. And there we go to hidden underscore image and say upload. That's fine. We need to give it a name. And this time I'm just going to refer to it to the very cool uh, apes and then underscore uh, hidden image um, and I am following no naming conventions but please do follow um, but this is just for the tutorial so hidden image okay so now we've got the very cool apes hidden image as a single file and it's named as hidden.png so we need to go ahead and copy the CID go and open our folder and in the JSON file now I'm simply going to edit this with a text editor I don't need to use Visual Studio Code always. I need to replace the CID part. So just make sure that your folder structure for the hidden metadata looks like this. And that it also has the hidden.png here at the end. Because we are trying to grab this file. Go ahead and save this. And then go back to Pinata. Click on Upload Folder. Select. Go to Desktop. Hidden. And now we're going to upload our hidden metadata. This is the metadata part. So I'm also going to call it hidden. Click on upload. And then once this is uploaded, we now have the hidden metadata section, which we first going to display to the user before we display the real metadata behind this hidden image. Let's go ahead and check it out. Click on this eye icon and then it should open something like this. We need to now go and type in forward slash hidden and then remember JSON. So when we do this, hopefully we get this back. Sometimes this gateway of Pinata might be too slow. 
So what you can do is instead type in over here, ipfs.io, and let's try IPFS and see if it's a bit faster. And there we go. There's our metadata. To test the image, I'm going to copy this part and replace everything here up until the QM. Now we are seeing the image that everyone will see before the actual metadata is revealed by the program and then the contract displaying actually the proper metadata. So now it is finally time to move over to go ahead and deploy our contract. Now that we have all the links we need on Pinata. So the very first step is to have a profile on etherscan.io. It's free, so just sign up. Once you have signed up, you can go to your profile up here in the right hand corner, select API keys, and then now we need to create a new API key. It is free because we're not gonna use it. Uh, we're only using it to verify the contract, so click on add. Then I'm gonna make this my test key. I'm going to remove this after this video, so uh, just to keep things secure, but this is what you need. And after creating it, we will use this in the CLI. So just keep this page open for now. For the next step, we need to go back to github.com forward slash hashlips dash labs. Yes, not this one. This is the repo where the art engine lives, but we need to go to this hashlips dash labs organization. So type in this into the URL, go here, and then click on the NFT ERC721 collection repo. Once you do that, we need to download the latest release. It's crucial to download the release that I'm showing to you in this video. So in our case, downloading version two. Click on the release and then go and download the source code. I just wanna take a moment to mention that we are an educational channel and all the code we place out is open source. That being said, we do not take any responsibility for people using the code and something going wrong. We do, however, test everything, but we have to add that in our videos. I also want to just uh, take this time to thank you, Marco. Laharco, as you can see, the contributor, the creator of this CLI. He's an amazing dev, so I urge you guys to go and check out his videos. He's got a YouTube channel too. And we are going to be hosting the master classes together. Let's now go ahead and check our source code that we've just downloaded. We have now unzipped the project and here it is. This is beautiful, but we need to open this in our IDE. Before you have downloaded Visual Studio Code, or if you haven't, get Visual Studio Code and also make sure that you've got Node.js installed. Now let's go and open Visual Studio Code. And here I'm gonna say open, desktop, and point it to this project. Once I do that, make sure that your uh, Visual Studio Code structure on the left-hand side looks like mine because you need to be in the root directory of that project's folder to do the commands that we are about to input. For the next step, go and open a new terminal and let's go ahead and install the Truffle framework globally. So type in npm i-g and then Truffle. Once you run this command, it may take a while but just let it be, let it install, and we need this framework to work together with our hard hat um, framework so that we can interact with the blockchain. So once this is installed, we can then go ahead and install the dependencies for each of our um, sub projects. Great, so now we have Truffle installed. If you didn't get to this point, just make sure that you have Node.js installed and you can verify that again by just typing in node-v. Now that we have Truffle installed and everything is going well, the next thing that we can do is type in Truffle. So uh, Truffle dashboard. And then hit enter. Truffle will open up the browser automatically. And at this point, you need to have MetaMask extension installed on Chrome. And then what you can do is open MetaMask and just make sure that you are on the correct address that you want to deploy this contract from and on the correct network. This is very important. For testing, we are going to be on the Rinkeby test network. But if you want to deploy your contract on the main network, then you simply have to switch your network, pointing to the Ethereum main network. So keep this in mind. I'm going to go and switch this back to Rinkeby 
because we simply want to deploy this on the Rinkeby test network. Once I'm sure I'm on the right address and on the right network, I can go ahead and click on connect. MetaMask will open and I can say next, connect. And then once it's connected, it will say, please confirm. And I'm going to say confirm. Once you've confirmed, Truffle is now waiting for incoming requests. Where are these requests going to come from? Well, it's going to wait and see if anything of our program is trying to interact with the blockchain. And then once it does, it's going to pop up the data here that we want to pass. And this is where we have to come back and confirm it so we can do that interaction on MetaMask and confirm it. You'll see this happening throughout the video. Okay, so we are on the Rinkeby connected to my address. Be ready to go back to Visual Studio. So the next thing that we'll need to do is install our dependencies. I like using Yarn for this because it just installs it way more smoother. So to make sure that you have Yarn installed, firstly we need to make sure what Node.js version we have. This is because depending on what Node.js version you have, you can install Yarn differently. For everything greater than 16.10, you can do it this way or for anything below 16.10, you can do it this way. Let's go and verify which version we have and which command of these two you should run. Currently, we are running our server. So here it's waiting for our request. So we can't really use the same terminal to check our node version. Usually now we can use a new terminal while this is running and do the rest of our application. But I just wanna show you that you can still stop this by pressing Control C and now it's out of this execution. What this means is if I refresh this page, it's now closed. I wanna show this because you will need to have this running to interact with your blockchain. But while this is now down, I'm quickly gonna check the node version and we have node-v and we can see that I'm running 14.18.2. So to install Yarn, we are going to use this one over here because it's below 16. So just go and do that. And I'm just going to install and maybe enable Yarn to run on this machine. Once that is done, I can clear the terminal. To clear the terminal on a Mac, you can press Command K. Now let's get back. And how do we get Truffle's dashboard back up? Well, it's very easy. You can just simply run the command again. So Truffle, and then dashboard. Once you do this again, Truffle will spin this back up and you can simply connect to your wallet. And there we back to our waiting for the request screen. It's important for you to see this so that if you don't know how this got closed, that you can just simply run it again in another terminal. I'm gonna leave this running and now create a new terminal. Cause next, we will need to install the dependencies of the smart contract project over here. You can see my terminals on the right hand side. So our node terminal over there is still running uh, Truffle's dashboard. And that's why this is still waiting. And now we're going to go to this new terminal. You can create new terminals by clicking on the plus icon. So now that Truffle's dashboard is running, we are connected to the MetaMask side, we need to go ahead and install the dependencies for the smart contract. You can see our folder structures have a minting DAP as well as a smart contract. These are technically two different projects and each one has its own dependencies. So we are first going to start off with the smart contract in the terminal. We are currently in the root. So we need to move inside of this folder. So type in CD smart contract and hit enter. Now we in the root of the smart contract folder. We can now go ahead and run yarn. So just type in yarn and hit enter. Yarn will go ahead and install all the dependencies needed for the smart contract project. Now that our dependencies have installed, let's look at the folder structure. So in the smart contract project, the one that we are now pointing to and have stored the dependencies for, we can go ahead and see that the config file is one of the most important ones. This collection config.ts, we are going to update the collections details how we want it in just a second. There's also a whitelist.json, 
and you simply append and change the addresses that you would like to be whitelisted during your mint. In our masterclass, we will be showing you how you can adapt this list even during the mint is taking place. So be sure to visit the masterclass. Then we've got this .env.example file. We're going to now duplicate this. So copy and paste it. Then you need to rename it to simply say .env. Previously, this file, you had to import your private keys. And now it's simply not necessary anymore. It even says this here in the little uh, commented out sections. To prove that you do not need your uh, private keys anymore, I'm simply going to remove this section altogether. We do, however, need to fill in our collections prefix, the CID from Pinata, as well as our block explorer. And this is the API key that we created on Etherscan. Now it's time for us to update these values. So starting with the CID, we can get this from Pinata. And this is not the hidden metadata. This is actually the real metadata. So this one. I'm going to go ahead and copy the CID. Go back and simply replace it. Then I need to get my block explorer, which we have the API. We can go to Etherscan and copy this value. Yours will be different. Once you've copied it, go back and replace it. Save this file by pressing Command S on a Mac or just save it by going to File, Save. There we go. Our .env file is now set up and ready to go. We can now close this because we're done with the env files and go back to the configuration file. At this point, you can probably fill out the whitelist uh, addresses like I said, or you can do it on a later stage as well. Uh, also, before we're going to go and continue, just want to mention, this is the contract that we will be deploying. It is the ERC-721A contract and reduces the gas of minting tremendously. Scrolling down in this contract, this is something I want to mention is that right here at the bottom with the withdraw function, here is a little thing that we've implemented in all of our contracts. And this is a 5% fee that goes to the Hashlips organization for producing this code. It is optional, however, and if you do not want to contribute the 5%, you can simply remove this section over here. Keep this section in here and it clearly states to not remove this. Otherwise, you will not be able to withdraw the funds from this contract. So, but that being said, if you just don't want to touch this contract and just deploy it as it is and contribute 5% to our cause, that is awesome. So that being said, let's go ahead and configure the uh, configurations file. Apart from the .env file, this configuration file is extremely important to put in the right details before you deploy the contract. Now, the very first step is to run this yarn rename contract uh, command. Why is this important? Well, it will rename the files to make it custom to your project. Notice how it says here, your NFT token. This will all change. So let's go ahead and run it in the terminal. Be sure to be in the smart contract terminal and run yarn rename. And we're going to rename this to say very cool apes AA and then hit enter. This will go through its stages and rename everything. As you can see now, we no longer have this contract saying your NFT token, but it says very cool apes AA. And that's the very first step. The rest of the configurations are pretty straightforward. For the token name, I will just call these very cool apes. And then maybe AA, like so. And then for my symbol, I can call it VC and keep it all caps, VCAAA, -A -A, like so. Now we need the hidden metadata URI. We can go ahead, go to Chrome, go to Pinata, and there it is. Copy the CID, and I just want to move back to Truffle. 
and then here we go and replace it in the CID. Notice how it says hidden.json, giving it the fully qualified URI. For the max supply, I'm going to make it now 20, seeing that we have 20 tokens that we've generated. Then the whitelist, the pre-sale and the public sale are all self-explanatory. Each of them takes an Ether price and a max mint amount per transaction. You can play around with these configurations yourself. For my collection, I'll just leave it like this. Now we get down to this part over here. You can see that the contract address is null. That means it's because we don't have a contract yet. We're going to now deploy the contract and once it's deployed, we get to replace it here. Once we have a deployed contract, we will still be able to use the CLI to change things like enabling the whitelist, enabling the pre-sale, public sale, and revealing as well as verifying the collection. To deploy the collection, all you need to run in the terminal now after filling in the details is yarn, and then you're going to say deploy, dash dash network and then the network we want to deploy to. Because we have Truffle set up, we can use Truffle. So we're going to say Truffle, hit enter and now it's us waiting for this to deploy. What we need to do is now go back to the browser and you will see this request coming in. This basically shows the data that we want to push to the blockchain. So if I say process, it's now going to deploy on the actual Rinkeby test network. How cool is that? Keep in mind that this CLI has a timeout. So because I'm recording this video, I'm taking way too long to approve this and it will fail. So just to show you in the code again, here it is failing because of a timeout. That's why I need to do it a bit quicker. I'm going to reject this and then go back to Visual Studio Code. This time, enter Yarn Deploy Network Truffle, hit enter, and without talking too much, wait for it to come up here on the request. Here it is, click on process, and then confirm. Now this is going to kick off and deploy our contract. We can open MetaMask and see it interacting over here. We can just give this some time and wait and go back to Visual Studio Code. Here it says deploying contract and it's successful. Here we have the contract's address. Now that we have the contract address in hand, we can simply replace this line over here where it says null, paste it over there and then we can say save. Just remember to put it as a string. So with these quotation marks. Hit save and now we can actually verify the contract. But first, let's go ahead and go to rinkaby.ethereum.io seeing that we've deployed this on Rinkaby. Search for this address and there we have it. We have our contract but it's not yet verified because we can't read the contract itself. We can do that too from the CLI. After clearing my terminal, let's go ahead and verify this contract. So now that we have our contract address over there, we're going to use it. So if you want to know all the commands that you can run through the CLI, you can simply go to the package.json file down here. Here's all the commands and with them is verify. So let me just go and run this. All you'll need to do now is run yarn verify the contract's address. Remember to add dash dash network and truffle. Then hit enter. There's no need to wait for the truffle to respond here. It will interact directly with the contract. So hopefully if this went well and I refresh Etherscan, we can see the green tick. And we can go ahead and read the beautiful contract. And what's nice is that it's all in separate files. This is so cool and that's all you need to verify your contract. If you run the command again, it will tell you that you have already verified the contract. So what is next? I guess now that we have a contract on the blockchain 
and we can see it here in all its glory, we now need a minting dApp. And this is what the program also provides. Before, I mentioned that there's two programs in here. Basically, the project that is the smart contract that we are busy with now, as well as the minting dApp. Let's go ahead and navigate to the minting dApp in another terminal, install the dependencies and actually launch the project. Because of how this project is set up, the minting dApp will already know about this configuration and everything should work. In order to do that, go ahead and create a new terminal. I'm going to click on that little plus. I still want my previous terminal there as well as my Truffle dashboard. So in my new terminal, I'm going to go ahead and say CD minting dap forward slash. And now I'm going to run yarn. This will install its own dependencies and then we can spin up the dev server. Once the dependencies are all installed, all you need to do is run yarn dev dash server. Hit enter and this will spin up a local dev server and you can simply click on this link over there, the host. So let's click on that or let's right click and say open follow link and here we go. It's running on port 8080 and this is our minting dApp. It is beautiful and basic and you can customize this because it's purely a React app. Now we can see my wallet address that's connected, the status as well as the supply. Because this is closed, we need to open it and the first stage is to open up the whitelist. But before I do that, let me go and add my address to the whitelist JSON file. I'm going to go ahead and copy that, go back to Visual Studio Code. This time I'm going to move back to my previous terminal because we want to open up the smart contract. Then we're going to go ahead and go to the configurations, whitelist, and I'm going to replace my address right here at the top. Save this. And now I can open up this contract for the whitelist sale. This is where things feel like magic. Let's go and interact with our contract and have the DAP updated. Remember, we are now changing things in the smart contract project. They are already linked. So all we need to do now is let's go ahead and check the package.json. We can see all the scripts that we are able to run. And the one we are looking for is this whitelist sale open. You can open the whitelist, close it, open pre-sale, close it, public sale, and close that too, as well as reveal. But we have to start with the whitelist. So let's go ahead and type in yarn, whitelist open, dash dash network, and truffle. Hit enter. And now something interesting will happen. It's going to tell us to verify a few things. It's going to say we need to process this one first. Say confirm. Then it's going to try and complete this. Basically, this is setting the price or setting the Merkle route, then the price, and then it's going to unpause the contract. So let's wait for these things to finish. We can also keep an eye on this on Visual Studio Code. There we see enabling whitelist. Let's just double check here. Accept this one as well. And there we go. In the terminal, it says it's done. So basically, it updated the proof and then opened up the contract for whitelist sales. So now, if we go back to our DAP and we go ahead and refresh this, this should tell us what the state currently is. And there we go. We can see that it's now whitelist only, the supply is 20, but because I'm a part of this whitelist uh, Merkle tree, basically, I can mint. So I'm going to go ahead and actually mint and I can't click up or down because remember, the whitelist mint per transaction is one, so I can only mint one. I'm going to click on mint. And there we go. Let me confirm this. I think this is cool that the minting DAP reflects now the total supply and everything is working, whitelist only. So let's go ahead and see if it shows up on OpenSea. 
and indeed it does. Here it is, the very cool Apes AA, but it's the hidden metadata. We are still in the process of doing our whitelist sale, so let's go back to the DAP and let's go ahead and maybe mint another one. So I'm just going to mint another one and it says uh, address already claimed. How cool is that? It knows that I already have minted my one. So I'm going to close it and go back to Visual Studio Code and now close the whitelist. I want to open it up for the pre-sale. So just change the previous command, which was yarn whitelist open to whitelist closed and then network truffle. Running this, you need to go back to the browser, go to your truffle and wait for the incoming request. So here's the first one, accept it. And it's important for you to be on the account that you have launched this contract from. It now says that our whitelist has ended. So if we go back to the minting DAP and we refresh, we should see the status also being updated. So let's have a look. And yes, sale status is closed and one out of the 20 have been sold. And this is the process of how you would handle your collection. The next step would be to instead of opening the whitelist, you would open the presale. So you'll type in presale dash open and then enter. Go back to truffle. And like I said, if truffle doesn't spin up, you can always type in truffle dashboard and then run it again. Here we can say process. And now we're going to open the presale. So let's go back to Visual Studio Code, wait for it to do its thing. You can see that it's updating the price. So in this stage, we might need to do a second incoming request, just uh, depending if we need to unpause and pause it. Updating mint per TX. So uh, let's go in here. And yes, now we need to click process again. Confirm. And let's go back to VA Studio. And let's see what the next step will be. The last step is unpausing the contract. So this will be our third request this time. So process and confirm. It's doing these things step by step to make sure that each transaction is successful before moving on to the next one. Once this is complete and successful, our minting DAP should now be open to the public in its pre-sale form. So in Visual Studio Code, we can wait for this transaction to be successfully done and there it is, it's done. We can go back and refresh our DAP and now we should see that our pre-sale is running and people can now mint. Anyone should be able to mint right now, not only whitelist members. And that's basically how it works. Now you've seen me open the whitelist, close the whitelist. You can do the same with the pre-sale, open and close and the public sale until your whole collection is complete. I'm going to skip ahead a bit and let's reveal the collection. So at the very end, what you probably want to do is say yarn reveal dash dash network and then a truffle. Go ahead and execute this command to reveal your collection at the very end. So we can go to truffle and there's the request, process it, click on confirm and wait for it to reveal the data. Hopefully, if we're lucky, we will need uh, OpenSea to just be a bit faster today. But if we are lucky, we will be able to see our revealed NFT. So I have noticed that I should have uh, accepted this request from uh, Hardat uh, going through Truffle. But because I didn't, it timed out, which, like I said, is not a problem. All you need to do is if it timed out, just reject this request, go back to Visual Studio and rerun the command. What this will do is it will skip the initial one that it's already run. So you can just wait for this uh, revealing the collection again, process, and then do the last step because it will fall in a queue. So don't worry if you miss the step, just let it do its thing. And uh, you can always rerun the command if you need to uh, do it in due time. 
Now let's wait for this to complete. It is done. It says it's revealed. So technically, if we go to OpenSea and refresh the metadata over here, and we refresh the browser, we should see our NFT. And fingers crossed, <laughs> yes we do. This is the first time this worked that quickly on OpenSea, so I'm very happy. And we've got a revealed collection. That is how it is, ladies and gentlemen, to work with a collection through the CLI. And um, I need to show you the very last little step, just to keep in mind. The last important thing that I have to mention is that in our third terminal over here, where we are running the dev server, we need to stop this and actually do a build. You need to build your dApp and host it on a live server for people to use. So let's go and open the minting dApp just to see what happens. And in the terminal with, with uh, this process being closed, so control C will close it off just to make sure we can even clear the terminal. But make sure that you're in the minting dApp and run yarn build. And once you do that, uh, this will compile, Webpack will compile this. And it's very crucial to drop the public folder, you know, straight in the root of your server. So now that it's done, you will see in this public folder over there, copy the build and the index and just drop it in the root directory of your server, of your web server then everyone will have access to your beautiful minting dApp. You probably don't want to deploy the dApp as is because there's a lot of hash lips all over the place. So what you can do, it's a normal React app. In the source, you can change the images. You can also, if you know development, change the actual style of the app and how it works and how it looks. We'll go into depth in more upcoming videos on this on how to style and change it. But just keep that in mind. The last thing that I would like you to keep in mind is whenever you go to Truffle over here to make sure that your MetaMask is on the right network. Here you can double check if it's on Rinkeby on the main network as well as here. Now keeping that in mind, if you have struggled throughout this tutorial, you're more than welcome to go to the hashlips.online and follow these links. The Discord is a great space for developers and artists to come together and solve problems. If you still have more questions, don't miss out on the masterclass and uh, hope to see everyone there the 8th of March. So that being said, please leave a like, a comment in the video on what you would like to see next and give me a follow. Go and check out Marcus' channel as well. We hope to see you guys next week. And uh, till then, have an amazing day. Cheers for now.